welcome back to Capturing Christianity. My name is Cameron Bertuzzi. I'm exposing you to the intellectual side of Christian belief. And today we're inviting back Stephen Nemesh and Dr. Ryan Mullins to talk about the nature of God. Well, this is actually a sort of informal debate. And we're going to talk about four different arguments, two against classical theism and two in favor or two against uh, a modified view of classical theism. My brain is not working right now. Well, let me pull up my discussion scene here. We've got, again, Dr. Ryan Mullins and Stephen Nemesh. And uh, this is actually their second discussion on the channel. Their first discussion was sort of laying out some of the main concepts in th this whole debate. If you didn't even know this, there's a debate among theologians about the nature of God. And so we we talked about in the first discussion, we talked about all, uh, well, not all of them, but a good chunk of the different issues at play here. And it was a great discussion. It was very, very cordial. There was actually a very good response. If you read the, the comments of the video, we were talking about this before we went live. Uh, people loved the, the discussion. It was very cordial, like I said. And so I'm, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Ryan Mullins back and, and Stephen back. And today we're doing a, a, a debate. This is, they come from opposing views. Ryan is a modified classical theist. That's what his, uh, the, the label that he gives himself. And Stephen is just a classical theist and we'll we'll get some clarity at the out front at the outset on what these terms mean if you're just coming to this discussion you haven't watched the previous one uh, which by the way I highly recommend that you listen to the other one if uh, if you're watching this one in the future you're not watching live then I highly recommend that you pause this one check the link in the description of this video and watch that one first it's going to introduce a lot of the concepts that you probably need in order to really understand what's going on in this discussion today uh, but Let's let's at least I'll pass it over to you, Ryan, and let's get a perspective uh, from you. Just lay out some of the basic terms. I know that we went into a whole lot more detail in the first discussion, but just give me uh, your lay out what your position is. We'll pass it over to Stephen to get his position, and then we'll move into uh, some of these arguments here. Right. So so the model of God that I'm going to be defending in in, in today's episode is what's called like a neoclassical or a modified classical view of God. And so the idea is we reject uh, four classical attributes. You reject timelessness, immutability, simplicity, and impassibility. And what you do is you replace them with temporality, mutability, uh, what you call unity, and passability. Um, and so from, from there, you can say more things about this model of God, which is that it's a model of God that affirms that God has some sort of exhaustive knowledge of the future. And also um, that God is like, you know, has other properties like necessary existence, aseity, self-sufficiency, maximal power, maximal knowledge, maximal goodness, these sorts of things. So it, it, so it really is uh, the, main, the main issue here, the difference between Stephen and I is over these four classical attributes. Stephen, wh why don't we get you to, to lay out your position? Would, would you disagree with anything he said there? No, I wouldn't disagree with uh, what he said, although I would disagree with the position that he's going to be arguing for today. Uh, for me, the most essential part of classical theism is the doctrine of divine simplicity. God is not composite. He is not um, multiple in any way. He does not have various different properties which are somehow distinct from each other or distinguishable from one another or anything of that sort. God is pure, undifferentiated reality, pure, undifferentiated being, uh, and he is that in virtue of which everything contingent or finite exists. Uh, so for me, that's the essential point about classical theism, uh, the doctrine of divine simplicity, from which follow all these other doctrines, such as divine immutability, um, divine timelessness, and uh, impassibility. So uh, we're going to be arguing basically with respect to these four essential notions, uh, simplicity, timelessness, uh, impassibility, and immutability, he will be denying those doctrines and offering arguments to, to motivate that denial. I'll be maintaining those doctrines and offering arguments uh, in favor of, of maintaining them. All right. Well, it, it, so I think that it's going to be best if we just jump right in instead of doing introductions like we did in the first one. So if you want to hear more about my guests, then check the, the link in the description to the first video where we, where we talk more about their backgrounds. So let's get into the first argument. And so we have two arguments on each side. And the first one is titled Ma Freedom. And this is the modal collapse objection to classical theism. We're going to take, uh, we're going to try to limit these arguments to uh, about 20 minutes of discussion each, which we may or may not hold to. So don't, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. 
So let's start, Ryan, lay out what this objection is and yeah, let, help, help us understand it. Yeah, so let me preface by saying there are lots of different versions of the modal collapse argument. And so the one we're focusing on today is going to be focusing on this sort of conflict between the claim that God is purely actual and that God has freedom. And we're focusing on this one because uh, Stephen and I have both written on this one. So, we, you know, but like I said, there's other argument, there's other versions out there. So here's how this one goes. So on divine simplicity, God is said to be purely actual. And that means that God has no unactualized potential. And so I want to say this conflicts with the, uh, God's freedom. So on classical theism, God is said to be free and that God is the source of his action and that God has the ability to do otherwise. So he could do one thing or, 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 the, or the other. Now, with regards to creation, classical theism says that God is free to create this universe or another universe or no universe at all. And I think it's really hard to make sense of divine freedom if you want to say that God has no potential. So say that God decides to create, you know, nothing at all, like no universe whatsoever. Well, then it would seem like, you know, God's got all this potential to create something. And, well, that's not supposed to be the case if God really is purely actual. And imagine a different scenario. I say God creates this universe. Well, but then God has this unactualized potential because he could have created a different universe. And it seems that for any action that God freely takes, the fact that God could have done otherwise leaves God with unactualized potential. And that directly contradicts the claim that the simple God has no potential whatsoever. And so how exactly can the classical theist escape this? Uh, I think there's a couple different things you could probably say. Um, so one thing you can say, though, is you could say that, you know, whatever God could possibly do, he must in fact do. Because otherwise you're going to have to say God's got unactualized potential. So anything that God could possibly do, he must do. But that means that all possibilities are actual and things could not be any other way. And so what this, uh, to put this in other terms, like of like possible worlds, what you would have to say is this is the only possible world. There are no other possible worlds. And if this is the only possible world, then that means everything is necessary and nothing is contingent. And that's what we call a modal collapse because the distinctions are modal distinctions between like necessity and contingency. They all collapse into the, to the single category of necessity. And if we have modal collapse, then nobody has any freedom. You know, not you, not me, not God. No one has any freedom. And so that's the argument in a nutshell. I just muted my mm -hmm. microphone. It, the idea <laughs> is that, uh, let me pull up my... Right. No, like hardly anybody wants that. Um, so to give you an idea of like how bad it was, like there were some versions of uh, kind of based on divine simplicity uh, in the Islamic tradition that popped up and and entailed what they called the, the heresy of necessitarianism, that everything becomes absolutely necessary. And so, like I said, they called it a heresy. And so they're like, no, none of that. So like it's it's a very controversial view. Here's some of the consequences, I guess, if you get a modal collapse. So not only does no one have freedom, not even God. Um, a lot of different things you want to say, like say in like your uh, theodicy, like how you kind of deal with the problem of evil. So a lot of the standard theodicies, they'll say things like God could have uh, prevented this evil, but he didn't for a good reason. And so you're like, OK, cool. Well, if there's a modal collapse, you can't say that because God couldn't prevent an evil uh, because that would entail that God could have done otherwise. So there's a lot of different things you have to start getting rid of if you have a modal collapse. Like it really destroys a lot of the things you want to say in, the, in your theology. So when I switched scenes, it, it muted my microphone, but basically all I was saying was that this is a, a, a bad thing. You, you don't want to accept modal collapse. That, that's mm -hmm. all I was saying, and then I passed it over to Ryan, and he, he expanded on that. So, Stephen, let's turn it over to you. What, what are your initial thoughts on this argument? Um, I agree that modal collapse would be a problem. I don't want to accept the conclusion of modal collapse. But at the same time, I don't think that the argument from divine simplicity to modal collapse is convincing for the following reason. It seems to me that the argument imposes upon God a kind of notion of agency that is applicable in the case of creatures, but that does not really apply to God, given the doctrine of divine simplicity. Uh, because God uh, is absolutely, you know, pure, undifferentiated reality, uh, that means that he can't make choices. That means that he can't <clears throat> undergo a process of deliberation. He can't um, <clears throat> make a decision to make this world rather than another. Uh, again, something that's purely actual does not undergo any process of deliberation and it doesn't make a choice. In us, uh, our making a choice is an actualization of a potentiality that we possess. I am 
capable of continuing to sit here or I am capable of getting up and, and leaving somewhere else. And when I do make a choice, that's an actualization of a potentiality that resides in me. If God doesn't have potentialities, then that means that this model of choice can't be applied to him. But then the question arises, okay, how is it that you can prevent a modal collapse if God is not making a free uh, choice in order to uh, create this universe rather than another or rather than no universe whatsoever? I think at this point that it would be worth noting that the modal collapse argument presupposes what I have called in an in a article that I've written, the difference principle. The difference principle can be stated like this. A possible difference in effect presupposes a possible difference in the cause. And we can illustrate this difference principle by appeal to ordinary examples. Uh, I have a, a car, I drive a Volkswagen Jetta. When I step into my car, uh, if I don't immediately melt because of the Phoenix heat and my car's been sitting in the sun all day, if I don't immediately melt, I manage to put the key into the, you know, into the car, and when I turn it, the engine starts. And that happens more or less every time that I do it. Now, suppose one time I put the key in and I turn it, and the car doesn't, be, the car doesn't start, the engine doesn't ignite. The different principle says that this difference in effect presupposes a difference in the cause. And the cause here is understood as that total mechanism that explains the ignition. Whatever it is that takes place from the moment that I turn the key to the, you know, the ignition of the engine. Um, because the effect is different, that presupposes that the cause must be different. Uh, and the cause here, once more, is being understood as this total process. Uh, and this, is, you know, this difference principle is entirely plausible. It's, it's totally reasonable. That's the way we reason. That's the way we think about our interactions with the world. Um, you know, if, if normally something happens uh, as a result of a causal process and then on one occasion it doesn't happen, that means that something must have gone wrong with the process. There must be something different about the process as cause in order to explain this difference in the effect. My suggestion is that the classical theist who wishes to maintain uh, the contingency of the world has to deny the difference principle. God can remain totally unchanged, entirely you know, self-identical across all possible worlds, so to speak, even though the effect that he produces differs from world to world. In this world, he creates me. In a different world, he doesn't create me. In this world, he saves me. Maybe in a different world, he doesn't save me. Um, but these different effects do not presuppose or do not require a difference in God as their cause. God remains entirely the same and unchanged, uh, even though the effect that he produces can be different you know, from world to world. So I, I think that the, the first point of response would be this. Well, I suppose two points. First, the modal collapse argument um, attributes to God this model of choice or action that is, strictly speaking, inappropriate for God. Uh, and second, the argument presupposes a difference principle, which I think the classical Tia should reject. Oh, go ahead, Ryan. Okay, so the first point I guess I want to make is that, um, like, I agree that with Stephen that the argument is presupposing this difference-making principle. And it's so like when I wrote this argument, if like several years ago, I wasn't even aware that I was like I was assuming this this principle because it's just like so intuitively obvious that I didn't even think like I wasn't even aware that there was this thing. So when Stephen pointed this out to me like a few years ago, I was like, oh yeah, I guess so. Yeah, then this is like super uh, like plausible, like this principle is. So so the first thing I guess I want to point out is if you deny the difference making principle, uh, that's really counterintuitive. And so any view that can affirm uh, the difference making principle, it's already going to be more intuitive than any view that denies it. So if classical theism has to deny the difference making principle in order to avoid modal collapse, that is a very big cost for the view because you've you've given up something that's really, really intuitive. Um, this, the second thing, though, I want to point out is that there, there's this account of divine action that, I, that I'm still trying to get clear on from Stephen. So do you think God's actions are intrinsic to God or do you think they're extrinsic? Because there's like these two different kind of models that, like, um, that, that people are kind of toying around with these days. So which one are you, are you affirming? I think that when we talk about God's actions, though, that language can be interpreted in two senses. So let's mm -hmm. take the act of uh, liberating the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt, yeah. right? Um, God liberates the Hebrews. How do we understand that? Um, in what I call the effectual sense, that syntagm, or whatever you want to call it, refers to a state of affairs which takes place in the world insofar as it is brought about by God. So it refers to the state of affairs of the Hebrews being liberated from slavery insofar as this state of affairs was brought about by God. Um, on the other hand, there is also the causal sense. And in, in this sense, uh, this state of affairs, is in, or the, the language is interpreted in this way. 
God's act of liberating the Hebrews is that in virtue of which God, uh, you know, causes the state of affairs to take place. So the causal sense means that in virtue of which the effect takes place, and the effectual sense means the effect that's produced insofar as it's caused by God. I would say that there is no third term when we talk about God's action. Uh, if God is absolutely simple, then everything that he causes, he causes in virtue of himself and not in virtue of some kind of accident that he takes on. For example, if I decide to play the piano, uh, then my playing the piano is not explained solely by me, solely by me taken as a substance, but by me with the added accident of you know, intending to play the piano or acting in such a way. So my, I take on an accident, so to speak, in order to produce the effect. But mm -hmm. with God, because he has no accidents, there is no mediating accident. It's just God understood simply, so to speak, and then the effect that he produces. Um, and there is no mediating thing. It's not as if there's a choice that God makes, an intention that he forms, a decision that he makes uh, that is an accidental modification of him, which then mediates his causal power into the production of its effect. There is simply the effect that he produces and him understood totally and simply as its cause. But there's no middle term. So I, to some extent, I would say that God's action is wholly extrinsic, um, mm. if you understand it with respect to its effect. And it's wholly intrinsic if you understand it with respect to that in virtue of which he causes his effects. He causes his effects in virtue of himself and not in virtue of an accident that he takes on. Um, and his effects are entirely outside of him. There is no production of an internal effect uh, and then an external effect like there would be with me. I make a decision. I form a decision so that that decision as an accident is an internal effect. It's a modification that I take on internally, which then leads to an external effect. But with God, there is no mediating internal effect. There is only the external effect and the internal cause, which is identical to him. Right. Okay, so I've got these two senses in which I can talk about act. But which, so do you, okay. Um, so if you've got well, an intrinsic Ryan, model, would you mind explaining yeah, some, explain yeah, the ahead, difference between the, yeah, explain the difference between an intrinsic and extrinsic action? Yeah, so in intrinsic action, it's supposed to be, well, it's, it's supposed to be quite intuitive. It's like an action is something that I do. It's an intrinsic feature of who I am. Um, and so if you want to say give that... Give me an example. Uh, so like I go to pick up my glass of water and I drink a water. That's an action. Uh, and that's what I do. So it's a, it's, so when you say Ryan's action, you're referring to some intrinsic feature about me. Okay. Uh, yeah. So any action you perform, you're just going to say like, that's an intrinsic feature of, of what, of you. Like that's a thing you do. Uh, it's not a reference to something else. It's a reference to you. And so ex intrinsic models of divine action, like they're the most popular views um, uh, th uh, throughout history um, because the idea is like when I'm referring to like a divine action, I'm referring to something about God, like God did that. Uh, so God freed the Hebrew people. God created the universe. God did this, you know, so on and so on. Those are intrinsic features about God. Um, but if you do an extrinsic model of divine action, this is a relatively new view. Um, someone named uh, Matthews Grant has a, a new book out on this um, called uh, uh, was it Freedom and Universal Divine Causality. And so he tries to tease out this extrinsic view, and he says it's these two views are mutually exclusive. So it's one or the other. So either divine actions are intrinsic features of God or they're extrinsic features. Now, if they're extrinsic features, which sounds a bit like what Stephen's saying at some points, you're going to say God does not have choices. God does not have intentions. God doesn't have, you know, deliberations, any of the sorts of things. What you're saying is uh, God doesn't even have actions because the statement God acts is actually referring to features extrinsic to God, completely about the world and nothing about God at all. Um, so when I say God created the universe and the divine act of God creating the universe, what I'm really talking about is there's the universe existing with some kind of property, like being causally dependent upon God or something. So I'm making a statement about the universe. I'm not actually making a statement about God. Uh, so I think there's a problem for each view, though, uh, if you want to go with either of these ways to avoid the modal collapse. So that's why I was trying to figure out, like, which one Stephen wants to go with. So then I can go, well, here's this problem for this view. Here's a problem for the other view. Um, or we could it just sounds go. Like he, it sounds yeah. like he's kind of embracing both. Right. And if they're mutually exclusive, then I don't know how to. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know how you could have both, though. I want to eat my cake and have it too. That's the right. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I would say this: God produces His effects in virtue of something intrinsic to Him, namely, namely in virtue of Himself. Mm -hmm. So there is an intrinsic element. Uh, God Himself is that in virtue of which His effects are produced. Um, but I would say that His effect is entirely external. Uh, for example, when you like think, for example, about the action of imagining something. Say you're mm -hmm. imagining, you know. Uh, going suntanning on the beach. Uh, 
that is an internal action, right? You go from not imagining something to imagining it as a result of a decision to start imagining. And the imagining takes place internally. It's an accident that you take on. It's not something outside of you. Right. Um, and that's what happens also when we make a choice. First, we make a decision. We take on this internal accident. And that internal accident sort of you know, directs our causal power, so to speak, into an outside effect. What I'm suggesting is that there is no internal action for God. He does not form an intention. He does not make a choice. He does not decide to do something. He simply, in virtue of himself, produces an effect contingently. Right. And the effect is entirely external to him. Yeah, so everybody wants to say the effect is external. Um, The issue between these two different models that Grant's uh, toying around with is what the act refers to. Does the act really refer to God? uh, Or does God not actually have any acts? And it's it's really uh, completely extrinsic to God. So everybody's happy to say the effect, um, but we're interested in like what the reference is for action. Is it God or is it something else? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, so I, what I mean to say is that depending on how you interpret the language, it could be um, it could be one or the other way. I don't know that the two views are necessarily exclusive because okay. if you interpret the act causally, it just means that in virtue of which God produces this effect, and that is Himself. And if you interpret it effectually, then it is the effect that is produced by God insofar as it is produced by God. Okay, so let me run, I guess, an argument against, or like some of the consequences for the intrinsic view, see sure. what you think of it, and then we can run the, like, the argument against the extrinsic view to see what you think of that. Sure. Uh, so Matthew's grant, he points out, like, if you want to have simplicity and the intrinsic view, um, he says, uh, you're in, what are you going to end up denying God's freedom? Because God cannot act any other way. Uh, because, you know, God's one act is the same across all possible worlds. And so I guess if you want to deny the difference-making principle, like that might help you avoid modal collapse, but you would still not get the classical understanding of divine freedom, which is that God could act one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So you're going to still have this conflict between divine simplicity and and, and, uh, and divine freedom, like on the classical understanding of divine freedom and the classical understanding of divine simplicity. So you're still going to have this conflict. Um, so uh, you might, you, maybe you can avoid the modal collapse through, you know, this to not a difference making principle. It's not clear to me, but you would still have a conflict between freedom and simplicity. And that's a, that's a problem. Yeah. I would say that divine freedom should not be understood as an intrinsic property of God, uh, in the way that it is for us. I would say that divine freedom is really a sort of a circumlocution. It refers to the possibility of different things being produced by God. Uh, so When God creates the world freely, what does that mean? That means that this world has come into existence as a result of God's power or whatever, Mm -hmm. uh, but it it might not have, and a different world could also. So the freedom is external to God, so to speak. The freedom is understood in terms of the contingency of its effect and not in terms of an intrinsic contingency of operation within God. So I guess to some extent I wish to to commit myself to the external view, if if this is the way the discussion goes. Yeah, okay, so then I'll, yeah, so here's the extrinsic, uh, the problem for the extrinsic view, though. So when you're talking about, like, God's acts and God's freedom, so you're saying that they are not referring to intrinsic features of God, you're going to be saying they're referring to extrinsic features of the world, or of of things outside of God. Uh, And so what this model entails then is that God does not have actions, uh, and instead God's acts refers to, like, creatures and their properties. Now, if I say, like, um, God, God's act of creating the universe, like, and I'm not really referring to God, like, I just kind of want to like give an incredulous stare, I guess, at that point and be like, hang on, like, I'm pretty sure I'm talking about God. Um, but that's not like the biggest problem here. Uh, so uh, the bigger problem here is that when you say that God's act refers to something extrinsic to God, then you're going to be giving up an essential claim of divine simplicity. So divine simplicity says that all of God's acts are identical to each other, uh, such that there's one divine act, and then that one divine act is identical to God's existence and essence. Now, if God's act refers to things extrinsic to God, well, then that would be saying that, like, you know, all the things in the universe uh, are identical to each other, uh, such as there's just, like, I guess, one thing, uh, and then they're identical to God's existence and essence. And no classical theist wants to say that. So what you're going to be saying is, well, no, 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 those things are not really identical to each other. Like, Stephen and Ryan are not identical to each other, and they're not identical to God. Uh, and so you're like, well, then not all of God's acts are identical to each other, and then not all of God's acts are identical to God's essence and existence. And so you've given up divine simplicity, uh, or core claim of divine simplicity, and that's pretty bad, um, since the whole point was supposed to be defending divine simplicity. Yeah, that's okay. That's a good point. I I, I wonder here whether the terms that uh, Matthew's grant have uh, has established are not perfectly helpful. I would mm. say that um, that 
in virtue of which God creates me, creates you, liberates the Hebrews, reveals himself to Paul, you know, shows grace to a sinner, that in virtue of which all these things are produced is identical to God. Uh, but the effects themselves are obviously distinct from one another. You know, my, Paul's, you know, the revelation of God to Paul took place 2,000 years ago. The creation of the world took place however many billions of years ago. This conversation right now is happening, you know, now. So the effects are different. Uh, and God's actions understood in the effectual sense are not identical to each other. Right. That's, that's clear, right? So the effects that God produces in virtue of himself, no, they are not all identical to each other. However, every effect that God produces is produced by God himself, with which he is self-identical. It's not an accident uh, of God. It's not a decision to create this and a decision to create that. It's not a sort of a mental state that God en enters into contingently or anything like that. It is simply God himself uh, in virtue of which his effects are produced. So in that sense, God's actions are identical to himself. Um, you know, God is simply that in virtue of which his, his effects are produced. Uh, so his acts understood in that sense are identical, but his acts understood in terms of the effects produced are not identical to each other. So I think that you don't get the, I don't think that you compromise divine simplicity if you, if you interpret things this way. Right. So you're getting rid of the extrinsic model. So you got to go back to the intrinsic model. Uh, I suppose what I mean to say is that God's action sort of um, explodes these categories. Um, it's not as if God's action is so external to him that it's not, it doesn't even have a connection to him, right? It's not as if the, the liberation of the Hebrews has no connection whatsoever to God. Uh, it has some connection, namely it's caused by him. Um, but it has exactly the same cause as any other effect that God produces. There's not a, a decision now at this point in time to liberate the Hebrews and then a decision later on in history to, you know, show himself to Paul or whatever. Uh, right. That in virtue of which the effects are produced is always God, simpliciter, um, but the effects themselves are distinct from one another. And I suppose I, my suggestion is simply to say that this, these two models, extrinsic, extrinsic, I think that they are not adequate for describing the the phenomena, so to speak, the, sure, the, of God. the facts, yeah, the phenomenon of God, yeah. Okay, so are you guys ready to move on to another argument? And we're we're basically mm -hmm. already at the end of it, at, at the at the end of the first section. I would like to make one point about denying the pr the difference principle, and I think we can. So Ryan and I discussed this on the Onscript podcast. So we go into a little bit more detail there. Mm -hmm. If if we don't get to discuss it in much detail here, we do discuss it there more. There's I a would lot of say, detail, yeah, yeah. I would say that denying the difference principle, you know, is like how uh, Mark Twain described the music of Wagner. It's not as bad as it sounds. Uh, I would say that indeterministic causation, if you admit indeterministic causation, you have to deny the difference principle. Uh, suppose that A causes B indeterministically. To say that it causes B indeterministically is to say that um, B is not the only possible effect of A, given the way A is at some state, you know, at some point in time. So that means that A, at a certain point in time, can produce B or can produce another effect, uh, C, let's say. Um, now, if it can produce one and it can produce another, that means that the possible difference in cause, or the possible difference in effect, is not, you know, does not require a possible difference in cause. That's precisely what it means to cause indeterministically. It's to one in the same state can result in different, you know, mutually exclusive effects. So I would say that to the extent that a person is inclined to admit indeterministic causation for whatever reason, whether because of findings in contemporary science or because of a commitment to libertarian free will, um, to that extent, they would also have to deny the difference principle. And what I mean to say basically is that God's causation of the world, primary causality, in other words, is indeterministic. It, it is, uh, God can remain exactly the same and produce a different effect. Brian, one of the things that popped up in my mind as you were laying mm -hmm. out there the argument originally was that it seems like the classical theist could just deny the principle of alternate possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it could, it, it, but you'd be denying the classical doctrine of divine freedom. So that's that's the whole point is if classical theism is really committed to divine simplicity and its particular understanding of uh, divine freedom, then you uh, then you got a conflict. So either way, you're going to have to be giving up some classical uh, uh, like concept here. So you could deny the principle of alternate possibilities. Um, here's some of the consequences of that, though. One, uh, you lose the classical understanding of the ground of contingency. Um, so the ground of contingency in the classical model is God's ability to do otherwise. So uh, all contingency is supposed to be rooted in the contingency of his will. Uh, 
Um, you also lose the very idea of uh, the doctrine of the decrees, like God could have decreed this, he could have decreed that. Um, and so that entails all sorts of things related to creation, providence, predestination. So basically, you'd, you could do that if you want, but then you'd be losing vast portions of classical Christian doctrine uh, as they're classically formulated. Um, so which I, which yeah, I'm happy to say, like, uh, fine, that's, if you want to do that, go for it. Um, because what you'd have to be doing is giving up something in the classical, uh, story somewhere. So you still have a conflict. Okay. Well, let's move on to the second mm -hmm. argument. And someone in the comments was saying, why can't we just focus on one? So we're, if you just got here, we're, we're doing four different arguments today. So one of them, the one that we just discussed is an argument against classical theism and the, the next one that we're going to discuss is against modified classical theism, basically against Ryan's view. So uh, why don't we have Stephen lay out what this one is? It's called Get a Load of Thisness. Yeah, <clears throat> Get a Load of Thisness. Uh, basically, the argument that I want to offer here is an argument from what's called constituent ontology um, for the doctrine of divine simplicity. Uh, and I will basically be, in, you know, I will be inventing my own terminology for this for the sake of this argument, I think it helps to get the point across clearly. The first point that I want to make is that the objects that we encounter in everyday experience, uh, cats, dogs, horses, Pat Metheny, whatever, um, these objects are what you might call this suches. So every object that we encounter in, in experience is a this such. What does this such mean? Uh, thisness refers to particularity, to individuation. Right? Everything that we encounter is a this. It can be individuated uh, in comparison to its environment, in comparison to other objects. Suchness, on the other hand, um, refers to the fact that the objects of our experience are not bare particulars. They're not bare ipseides, so to speak, but rather they have certain intelligible content. So, for example, um, my cat has a certain weight, a certain height, a certain color fur, a certain species, um, a certain temperament. These are suchnesses. These are qualities that the cat has um, uh, and which I come into co with which I come into contact in my experience of the cat. But notice what I, what I experience is not a bare particularity, but neither is it just pure suchness. I never just see weight in general. I never just see color in general. I always see an object of a particular weight, a cat of a particular color. Uh, so every object of experience is a this such. It has thisness, but it also has suchness. It has these two, what you might call principles, a principle of individuation and a principle of intelligibility. The principle of individuation is what makes the object a this. It makes it a particular. It individuates it. Whereas the principle of intelligibility is what makes the object a such. It gives it content. It gives it some sort of meaning or sense that I can, you know, discover in experience. Now, the, the point that I want to make is the following, thisness and suchness considered in themselves have no essential connection to one another. Like I said, suchness is general. Weight, you know, is, is a general thing. There are different objects that have different weights. Um, whiteness, my cat is, has white fur. Whiteness is a general thing. Uh, so the whiteness that is in my cat is the whiteness that's on my shirt, the whiteness that is in another cat that's white or whatever. Uh, the whiteness on the pages of Oliver Crisp's latest book, whatever it might be. Uh, the whiteness is not essentially connected to this cat. You know, this cat can go out of existence and whiteness would remain. Um, alternatively, this cat understood as an individuated object can also become a different color. It can take on a different color. It, you know, perhaps its fur can change colors. Uh, it can be painted. It can do whatever. Um, so what I mean to say is that although the individual object is a this such, thisness and suchness have no essential connection to one another. Suchness is general. That's why it can be instantiated by multiple objects. That's why there can be more than one cat, more than one white thing, more than one thing that has a certain weight. Whereas thisness is just pure individuation. It doesn't have any content. It just individuates. So then the existence of the this such is the unity of these two things. You get a cat once you get catness and a principle of individuation. Once you take the general catness and you individuate it, then you get a particular cat. And the existence of the cat is precisely the being united, the being unified of these two principles, the thisness and the suchness. Now, notice, thisness and suchness have no essential connection to one another. This means that the unity of the this such, the unity of the, of the cat, has to be explained in terms of something outside of it, right? Because you cannot, the cat doesn't exist sort of by default. 
uh, the unity of the cat has to be explained by something else. And in order to prevent an infinite regress, this thing cannot itself be a this such. It cannot also be an individual being with a particular nature and particular qualities, right? Because then we would have to explain the unity of its ontological constituents, so to speak. That which explains this suchness, that which explains the unity of, a, of the this such, cannot itself be a this such. It just has to be pure, undifferentiated actuality, you might say. And that is precisely the, the classical theistic conception of God. So my argument against um, the modified classical theism would be that you cannot de deny the doctrine of divine simplicity because um, if God were this such, there would have to be something outside of him which explains the unity of his ontological constituents, the unity of his principle of intelligibility and his principle of individuation, and God cannot have any such cause. He's supposed to be the rock bottom level. Uh, therefore, he cannot be composite in this way. He cannot be a this such. He cannot be a particular being with a certain nature and certain qualities. He just has to be pure, undifferentiated uh, actuality. Ryan, pass it over to you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, with this sort of argument, I like there's a bunch of assumptions in there that I, I, I find a bit confusing. So, um, so one of the things is like uh, it seems like this argument saying like there can't be any like bare particulars. You can't have like a substance without properties, and then it gets me to like this. Well, not like okay. So like you don't want to. Stephen doesn't want to say God's a substance. Um, so I've got this thing uh, that I can't actually call a thing either. That has so it's no particular thing with no particular properties, and this is so there's no thing with no particular properties that explains all of reality. Mm -hmm. uh, like I mean, I, that just sounds weird, right? Like the way I just said it obviously sounds weird. Like there's no particular thing that, that with no particular properties that explains reality. Um, right. Yeah, so like I, I'm trying to figure out what the conclusion really is, and I know it's supposed to be like find simplicity, but like if it's no particular thing with no particular properties, I mean, that, again, it sounds like atheism. So like it's, and it's not a substance. So it has to be something at least substantial. Like, I don't know what the conclusion is. So if I don't know what the conclusion is, I can't figure out if the argument's really sound. Um, like, uh, do, uh, do you see what I'm getting at here? Like, I don't, like, if I don't know what, if I don't know what God is, then like, again, I get, I'm, I'm left with no particular thing with no particular properties. Right. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, let's just start right there. And there's some other assumptions we're going to get yes. into in a minute, but Even, let's start with that one. Do you have a do you have like a syllogism for this argument? Here's a here's a syllogism. Um, uh, let's say every this such uh, is dependent upon something else for its existence. Uh, God is not dependent on anything else for his existence. Uh, therefore, God is not a this such. That might be a, a quick syllogism, right? So basically, the idea is that this ontological category of this suchness. Mm -hmm. um, implies the necessity of a cause it implies the necessity of an explanation for the existence of something and because god himself cannot have anything that explains his own existence he must not there he therefore cannot fall under this category he cannot be a this such okay and so are you taking the the this such is that like a like a literal composite of some sort yeah, I would say that it's a composite, but I wouldn't say that it's like two pieces put together, right? Like my, mm -hmm. my hand is a composite of five fingers. Um, <clears throat> it's, a comp it's, a, it's a form of composition that takes place on a different plane. It's, it's metaphysical or ontological composition is what it is. Um, you know, it's not like, um, you know, here I have a glass of water. This mm -hmm. glass is a, is a this such. It's a particular item, but it also has a suchness. It also has a, a content, namely that it's made of glass. It's in a certain shape. It has a certain weight. Um, you know, it, you know, uh, is transparent or whatever, etc. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the idea is that anything that has this form of composition, because suchness and thisness, those two essential, you know, components have no necessary connection to one another. Therefore, there has to be something outside of them that explains their being unified. And this cannot itself be a this such. Right. Okay. So there's some myriological assumptions in there, like accounts of like parts and holes that I, I, I guess I find really confusing. So like when I think about parts and holes, like typically we talk about substances that can form composite substances mm -hmm. and like material like uh, substances, like those are great cases. Um, but when I think about like metaphysical composition, I start to lose my, my grasp a bit here. Uh, and here's why. So when I talk about like the simplicity of an electron, mm 
Uh, I want to say like, well, it's a substance. It's not further divided, supposedly. Um, and it's because there's not other subst substantial parts that it has. And so I'm like, oh, it's simple. Same thing with a soul. I want to say like souls, minds, persons, they are simple things because it's just a single substance. It's not composed of substantial parts. Um, and so now you're wanting to go, well, there's these other things called metaphysical parts. And I'm like, okay, cool. What are these? And they, things that come to mind would be like properties, I guess. Um, and I don't, really see why I should take properties to be literal parts. So like I'm kind of really losing my grasp on why I should think like this is a composite relationship of any sort, uh, mm -hmm. especially when I start reflecting on certain kinds of properties that like a thing might have. So when I look at like a triangle, like it's going to have like certain properties that like seem like they can't float free from each other. Um, right. And I'm going to be like, oh, cause, like, is that really parts? It doesn't seem, this doesn't seem quite right. Um, and then when I think about like uh, certain attributes that like every model of God wants to say about, uh, about God, um, when I reflect on some of these attributes, then it seems like, well, I really lose my grasp on why I should think that this and suchness or like, I guess, a substance and its essences could come apart, depending on what its essential properties are. So so Benedict uh, Gurka, he's, a, he's a, a panentheist these days. And so he says all models of God have to affirm that God has the properties of like the greatest possible being or the single ultimate ground of reality. Um, I'd want to throw in some other things like necessary existence, self-sufficiency, aseity. And I'm like, Anything that has those attributes, if those are like essential properties of, 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 of a thing, I don't see why I should have something else that explains why they're unified, like something outside of itself, because it seems like it's already built into the concept there. And so that, that's like a step there that I'm missing in this uh, in this uh, this argument here of like, why should I get how do I get there? Like, why, why is it just that there's a thing like a, a substance and it has properties? Why should I think that in all of these cases of substance and properties? that they can come apart because it seems like if you have like a thing that's like a necessary existent being well that couldn't come apart its substance mm -hmm. and its property couldn't come apart at least that property maybe other properties could but like its necessary existence i don't see why that could come apart well we'd have to i think become a little bit clearer on the nature of suchness because that's essentially what we're de what we're describing here Mm -hmm. Suchness basically is the totality of the intelligibility of an object. Suchness is everything about an object that can be known. Mm -hmm. um, and we refer to these things as qualities or attributes or properties, whatever. Things that can, and, you know, things that can be formed as predicates in a sentence, in a, in a, a judgment about something. Um, think, for example, of me, right? When you, when you look at me, um, you see various things. You see that I have skin. You see that my skin is of a certain tone. You see that I have hair, you see that I'm a male, you see that I uh, seem to be of a certain height and so on, that my body has a certain shape. Um, these are things that are here in me. These are things that you encounter in me, and they sort of together compose my existence. Now, some of these things can go away and I remain, and some of these things cannot go away without my disappearing. For example, if you take away my humanity from me, then I'm no longer there. If you take away the color of my skin, I might still be here. I can get tanner, I can get paler. You know, I can lose weight, I can gain weight. So some of some of what goes into the suchness of a thing is accidental or contingent, you might say, but some of it is essential to it. It cannot go away without the thing itself disappearing. Um, nevertheless, suchness per se is general, right? Uh, so you think about a, a necessarily existing object. Um, let's say that it has some property, right? It could be that that thing exists necessarily, but it doesn't follow that it wouldn't need an existence, an, an account of the, you know, or a cause of its existence, because even if it has this property, whatever it is, like you might think, okay, it has that property, but that property has no essential connection to that object. That property could have been instantiated by a different object. That's what I mean when I say that suchness is general. Once you consider the property in itself, you see that it has no essential connection to the individual that ac actually instantiates it. And I happen to think that the idea of a necessary this such is actually contradictory for this reason. I think that such the generality of suchness um, is is uh, such that you know it, it it just means there there cannot be a necessary this such. Anything that exists necessarily has to uh, you know anything that exists necessarily and entirely on its own um, cannot be a this such. It has to be um, pure undifferentiated uh, actuality. Now you might ask this question, why can't there be a necessary this such? Why can't there be a suchness which is, which is essentially connected to a, to a thisness? Why can't there be a, a, a principle of intelligibility that is necessarily instantiated by a particular? 
The first point that I would make in response to this is that such a line of reasoning leads to an ontological argument. You can go straight from the concept of a thing to its existence in reality. So if you're inclined to deny the, to, refu to refuse the ontological argument, then you would have to reject this view. But I would also say that it seems to me that such a proposal is actually not far from the conclusion that I was trying to get at. Uh, this such, which is necessarily united, um, is basically talking about a this such whose suchness is intrinsically individuated and whose individuating principle is intrinsically content-filled or intelligible. It sounds to me like we're talking about something where thisness and suchness are really identical to each other. Um, and that would seem to be just a different way of formulating my point that this thing is not a this such in the ordinary sense. It's a this such sort of analogously. So it seems to me that you still get to classical theism if you adopt this line of reasoning. Okay, so I have three thoughts. Uh, the first one is, so suchness is something that it's the, it's the whatever makes something intelligible. Yeah, and the so, oneness of it. Yeah, so so anything that lacks suchness is literally unintelligible. Exactly. So the conclusion of the argument is there's something completely and literally unintelligible that is the explanation for all of reality. Yes. And so the classical theistic concept of God is literally unintelligible. Yeah, he is incomprehensible. He cannot be understood. Yeah. Exactly. I don't understand how I could under how I could comprehend that something's incomprehensible in that way, or like if something's literally unintelligible, then like. I, I yeah I, I you can't I can't even say, I don't I don't understand what I'm what we're talking about now because it's literally unintelligible. Do, like do you see like do you see my worry here? Yeah, um, I, we talked a little bit about this last time, and I suggested last time that there is a way of you know grasping things with your mind, which mm -hmm. at the same time is not understanding them. Um, think about the case of Socratic ignorance, right? Socrates knows that he doesn't know something. Um, on the one hand, you have a grasp of that thing. On the other hand, you are simultaneously aware of the fact that you don't know it. You mm -hmm. know, when you try to think of like, you know, what is justice or what is virtue or what is language, yeah. you know, you, you go through this line of reasoning and you're left with this sense that you don't understand the thing. It doesn't follow that you don't have a grasp of it at all. You're, you're still in contact with it somehow, but your contact is not a contact of understanding. It's a, it's a contact that is a sort of an awareness without understanding. And it's precisely because we can have such a contact with things that we can be aware that we don't understand something, right? Mm -hmm. The thing is there, we see it, we're in contact with it somehow, and yet we also are simultaneously aware of the fact that we do not understand it. Okay, so I guess, again, I guess my worry is, first, I, I, in general, I don't like to accept the conclusion of an argument if the conclusion is this thing is completely and utterly unintelligible. Uh, second, I don't understand how I can start saying things like God is omnipotent, God is omniscient, uh, God is triune, if God is literally unintelligible. Uh, and then further, like like the classical tradition was really um, uncomfortable for a long time saying God was infinite. Why? Because it, infinite for a long time meant unintelligible. Uh, and so like Origen has this argument where he's like, well, God's not unintelligible. Like, you know, and Augustine's like, well, if I have to say that, then like God would be unintelligible. So you've got these like a bunch of different classical theists who don't, who want to deny that God's infinite because infinite in their mind meant unintelligible. Mm -hmm. So... I've got this, I feel like I've got this conflict here within like the classical tradition that of like, do I really want to say God's unintelligible? That seems weird. Uh, and then I've got all these classical theists going like, well, no, we don't want to say that because um, that, that would be really bad because then we don't know what we're talking about. And it seems like we do know something, like we've got some kind of grasp here. I guess that's a, so yeah, so I find this a, a bit odd. I would make the point that when we talk about the incomprehensibility or unintelligibility, let's say of God, we are talking about incomprehensibility to us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our understanding, the way we understand things is as this such is. This such is are what we can understand. Um, God, because he is not a this such, is not understandable to us. It doesn't mean that he's like intrinsically unintelligible or without content or like whatever, meaningless. It's mm -hmm. just that it, to us, you know, we do not have a way of understanding so that we can understand God. Perhaps in the next life we'll gain some faculty that makes it possible for us, but for us as we, as we are now, we, we cannot understand God. That doesn't mean that God is unintelligible like a contradiction mm. might be unintelligible. It means that he is unintelligible to us. Right, okay, so for all I know, God could be all sorts of ways, but I can't know in this life. Well, you, you can know, for example, that God is not a this such. So whatever mm -hmm. you might want to say about God that might imply this suchness to him, you can know that he's not like that because yeah. he couldn't be like that. He has to be the explanation of this suchness. But what God is in himself, 
you know, is beyond understanding. That's what John of Damascus says in, mm. you know, his exact exposition of the Orthodox faith. He says, it's clear that God exists, but what he is in essence and nature is totally unknowable to us. Yeah. And then he goes on to explain about God's essence in all sorts of ways for a long time. And I'm like, John, like, what, what are you doing here? Um, yeah. Okay. So I guess the other point that I have is, other than like that it's unintelligible. Um, so this view entails like there's no such thing as unique properties. Like there couldn't be no properties that only one thing could have. I and think that there can like be... Like the property being pi could only be had by, I would think the number pi. Um, but like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just thinking like that's, that seems yeah. weird to me. Yeah. So I would, I, I think here that, you know, I, I wouldn't say that any predicate that we can come up with refers to a property. And I would mm -hmm. also say that predicates, um, you know, differ with respect to the nature of the property that they refer to. Some properties are extrinsic and some properties are intrinsic. Um, you know, um, for example, there are a lot of extrinsic properties that can only be had by one thing. For example, the first human being on earth, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that can only be had by one thing once it happens. Nothing else can be the first on Earth. But it doesn't follow that. That's not really the sort of property that I'm talking about. In order for there to be a first human, there has to be a human. And what I'm really referring to is this more basic level of composition, these intrinsic properties, these internal properties, mm -hmm. which you know build up the, the being or the existence of the particular object. Those are the ones that I'm concerned with. There can be unique properties in this extrinsic Cambridge sense of like the first person to step on earth, the first person to talk to Stephen, the first person to whatever, you know, uh, get married. There can be like first in those extrinsic ways, but these, these extrinsic properties presuppose the existence of the individual being, and it's the individual being that we're talking about when we mean mm -hmm. there cannot be unique properties, right? There can be no unique type of thing, that's true, but there can be unique uh, things with respect to their extrinsic properties. Okay, so that's a that's a it's a really interesting consequence um, that in in my mind just like lowers the probability or the plausibility of this, this sort of view because it seems to me you could have uh, unique properties like the greatest possible being or a necessary being or the sole ground of ultimate reality. It seems like those are like unique properties that only one thing could have. Um, so the final point I guess I had was so you said like if I if I want to reject a bunch of these things here, then um, I or if I want to say that God has the property of necessary existence, I'd have to affirm something like an ontological argument. Um, I'm happy with that because, I, yeah. Um, but I also think like a bunch of cosmological arguments would get me there too. So like arguments from contingency, the Kalam cosmological argument, um, like there's a bunch of different these sort of arguments could get me to necessary being. So it wouldn't have to be just the ontological argument. I would agree that, um, I would agree that the cosmological argument from contingency, for example, gets you to a necessary being. I deny that necessary being is really a property. Uh, uh, I don't think okay. that, you know, I, I don't think that necessary being, I don't think that being is a property. I think being is something that belongs to things. It belongs to beings, but it's not a property of theirs. Their properties go into their suchness, right? Whereas the being of a thing, its existence is the being united of its constituent parts. It's the being united of the suchness and the thisness. That's what the thing's existence is. Um, my, so I talked about this. Uh, with uh, Joe Schmidt on his Majesty of Reason show yes, uh, a couple of days ago, and mm -hmm. I made the suggestion that contingency per se, con contingent existence is this suchness. Because suchness is general, uh, that means that it can be instantiated by multiple objects. It's not necessarily instantiated by any particular thing. And that means that any particular thing with that suchness doesn't have to exist. So this suchness is what it is to exist contingently, uh, and for this reason, I would say that the only possible necessary existence is not a this such. Uh, he cannot have properties, right, mm -hmm. that qualify him and which are individuated in him. He has to. And, he has to be beyond this. Right, and it's an unintelligible. Right, unintelligible to right. us. Exactly. Right. Right. Okay. Hey, can uh, I can I uh, can I ask Stephen something? So I, I think uh, as you were laying this out, I was kind of thinking about. Um, your defense, your the, the going back to the sil the syllogism that you gave. You said every this such is dependent. I think that's what you said. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm sure that you've got some reasons for that. Probably having to do with uh, induction. I I wouldn't know that it's induction. I think that it follows from the very notion of a this such. It it, it follows from what thisness is and what suchness is. And we can again we can consider this in the case of a cat. You know. Every cat is a this such. It's a particular being with a cat nature, let's say, right? Now, 
cat nature is general. That's why there can be multiple cats. Cat nature per se is not connected essentially to any particular cat. Um, and you know the particularizing element, the individuating element, is just bare individuality. It's it's you know everything is an individual. So that means there can be individual cats, there can be individual dogs, there can be individual human beings. That means that individuation per se is not connected to any suchness. Um, so once you see that like suchness is general and individuate individuation also is is general in this sense, right? There can be individuals of any kind whatsoever. Uh, that means that every individuate every this such. Um, is a unity of these two things that have no essential connection to one another. They're together, but they don't have to be. The suchness doesn't explain why they're together. The thisness doesn't explain why they're together. And yet they are. So why are they together? It has to be something outside of that that explains that. Otherwise, it's just this brute, in con you know, brute contingency. They just happens to be a this such, even though nothing explains it at all. Um, so... Well, so maybe it's, that, maybe yeah, it's brute ahead. necessity. So go going back to something else you said earlier... May, uh, what what I'm thinking about is Platonism. So it seems like your view kind of rules out mathematical Platonism. So you can't have like a necessary number two that is is it, it's that seems to me like is a, a this such. I would agree that the the number two seems like a this such. Now here is where my views on mathematics and mathematical objects might come into play. I tend to think of mathematical objects as something like intellectual constructions. They're not just pure fictions, because again, we get the number one, so I say, from our encounter with individual objects. I see that an individual object is a one, and then I can subtract its oneness, I can abstract its oneness, so to speak, when I think about it. Uh, and then once I have the notion of one, I can do things with that. I can form the notion of a half, I can form the notion of two, and then I'm off to the races developing a mathematical system. Um, I would say that mathematical objects are constructions in this sense. They're not totally unrelated to reality. They have their basis in our, in our experience of individual objects from which we get our notion of one. Uh, but at the same time, there's no number two in the, you know, out there somewhere. Uh, the number two is, a, is, a, is an intellectual construction which has a basis in our experience of the world, but which is not, it doesn't like refer, it's not like the number two is there also. They're just individual things. All right, Ryan, would you like to say any last things before we move on to the next argument? I mean, I guess just if I have to accept an unintelligible uh, conclusion, I, I just I just can't accept uh, unintelligible conclusions. So I, I don't I, I just don't know what to do with this argument. I really don't. If it leads me to something that's unintelligible, I'm just I just feel like I'm lost. So, yeah, I don't have anything else to say on this argument. OK, all right, well, let's move on. Yeah. So the next Sorry. argument is uh, no worries. It's uh, God, you so ignorant. These names are amazing, by the way. It Ryan, you're the one that came up, up with these, with right? Them, but yeah. yeah. God, God, you so ignorant. And this is the problem of tense knowledge. And so, and, and this is an argument against classical theism. And this is an argument that's, that's rooted in your your dissertation. Is that correct? Your, um, your... I do discuss it in a chapter in, in my first book, yeah. Um, okay. It's Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, this is a slightly different version of it, though. So on classical theism, the claim is that God is timeless. And that means that God cannot under, undergo any sort of change or succession. Uh, but yet the claim from classical theism is that God is also omniscient. And so omniscience you could take to be something like, for any proposition, God knows of the truth value of that proposition. Uh, and so if there's a particular set of, or a particular class of, of pr propositions that would cause problems for divine timelessness. And so these are called tensed propositions. So tensed propositions, they concern the, the way the temporal world is. Uh, by making reference to an objective present moment of time. Uh, so, for example, like a tense proposition would be describing how things were in the past, how things are right now at the present, and how things will be in the future. So, uh, the, kind of the, one of the things you need to know for this argument is that tense propositions, they change their truth value over time. So, the proposition Stephen and Ryan will talk on Thursday, that that, that they're at one point in, in the past, like you could say, like, that that is true. But now it's false because we're currently talking now. So it's not like we will be because we are now talking. So that proposition is now false. Uh, and it's false because of the way the world is at the present moment. And so a timeless God cannot know the truth values of these propositions because that sort of knowledge would entail that God's knowledge would be changing. Because if God knows like the, the changing truth values of these tense propositions, then God's going to, his knowledge is going to be changing. Uh, so it seems kind of difficult to really think that God's going to be omniscient on this view. If if God's timeless and he can't know what's going on right now, 
they can't know what time it is right now. And it seems like, well, hang on, that's not really an omniscient being. Like, surely an omniscient being should know what time it is right now. But if he knows what time it is right now, then he's going to be changing. So that's that's the the big idea here for this argument. Go ahead, Stephen. I think there are a few things that I would say. In the first place, I think I would <clears throat> um, take objection to the notion of uh, propositions uh, that I think think may be presupposed by this argument, but I don't think that's the really substantial point. I think the substantial point to make here is that given the doctrine of divine simplicity, God's knowledge cannot be understood uh, by analogy to human knowledge. And I will make my point in the following way. I think that human knowledge is essentially um, passive and receptive. Uh, it's, it's a matter of the world, you might say, disclosing itself to me. It's a matter of something showing itself to me and my receiving that showing and then forming a judgment. Um, of course, God, because he is absolutely simple, because he is impassable, cannot be receptive in this way. Nothing affects him, nothing shows itself to him, nothing <clears throat> you know, discloses itself to him, and he doesn't form judgments on the basis of something outside of himself. This means that God's knowledge cannot be understood in this passive way. Uh, it has to be understood if, it, if, you know, if we're going to understand God's knowledge at all, which I don't know that I am really able to do, but I will venture some remarks here for the, for the discussion. I would say that God's knowledge has to be interpreted in an active way, uh, uh, basically as causing. Uh, what that means roughly is that God knows uh, that I am talking to Ryan right now because he is causing this to happen. And God knows that I, you know, God knew three days ago, let's say, if we can make sense of that. Three days ago, God knew that I would be talking to you today because he was going to cause it or he was causing it, causing the world to be such that three days from then we would start talking. Um, so I think that God's knowledge, according to the doctrine of divine simplicity, has to be understood causally. God knows things about the world uh, because he causes them to, to be. I would also emphasize that we'd have to distinguish between God's knowledge of things outside of himself and God's knowledge of himself if we can talk about such a thing. I don't mean to say that God uh, has no inner life whatsoever, as if he were a rock. Um, but at the same time, I do want to emphasize that I don't know what God's inner life is like. So if we can talk about a divine knowledge that is self-directed, a sort of divine self-knowledge, I don't know what that is. I am... I am, I am you know, simply going to say, I have no idea what that is. Um, I would say, however, that God's knowledge with respect to outside things typically should be interpreted in terms of causation. God knows things because God causes those things. You know, he is the explanation for why they happen. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't really affect the argument, though. So, um, and that's, here's why. So Augustine, like, wants to make all these moves. He's like, all God's knowledge is self-knowledge. Uh, and then he looks at this sort of problem and he's like, oh gosh, you know, God can't know what, what, what time it is now. And Augustine just goes, well, it would be bad if God knew that sort of stuff, um, because then he'd be changing. So God just, God just doesn't know that stuff. And, and then I want to go, well, then God's not really omniscient. Um, because so you, if you say God causes what's happening right now, that's, that's fine. Um, and with, with regards to this argument, it doesn't change anything because it would still be the case that there's a tensed fact that God knows. He knows it because he's the cause of it. But then at the next moment, the tense fact changes because God's causing something different. Uh, he's omnipresent to a different moment, um, and so then the facts have changed. And so, if God's knowledge is going to be reflecting the changes that He's actually like causally bringing about, again, you're still going to have these changes in God's knowledge. So we can make the knowledge like causal, but it doesn't change the the shape of the argument. I think that your response um, still involves importing a a notion of knowledge to God that is really foreign to Him. Uh, so I will say this, God's knowledge is not a matter of being related in a certain way to true propositions, for example. You know, we have to set that up, you know, uh, to the side. Uh, God is not really related to anything outside of himself in divine simplicity. So any conception of knowledge whatsoever that uh, would seem to suppose some kind of external relating on God's part has to be rejected. God does not know in that way. Um, now, so it's the case to... that God doesn't know. So, so we're definitely saying God doesn't know what time it is now, but we want to say like God's knowledge is not propositional at all. I mean, I would say that God does not know what time it is now if knowing here mm -hmm. means knowing the way that I do. Mm 
right, in right. this passive, receptive way, then no, he does not know in that sense. Um, how does God knowledge, you know, how can we say that God knows what time it is now? I mean, effectively, you would have to say that God is causing the present moment. That's what it is, you know. Uh, God is causing the total state of affairs that obtains at this present moment. Um, now, I, I think also here there's a, there's a really, there's a central difficulty because the doctrine of divine simplicity and classical theism more generally is a highly philosophical doctrine of God that does not really lend itself to a personalist understanding of God, right? You almost, it seems like ascribing omniscience to God seems, you know, unmotivated. Uh, mm. You know, if, if, if this is the way, if God is the cause of everything and he's not passive and receptive, he doesn't know in this passive and receptive way, then, you know, it seems like why would we talk about God's knowledge at all? I would say that talk about divine knowledge is biblically motivated. Uh, the Bible depicts God as knowing things, you know, before the word comes out of my mouth, you know it. Uh, you know my, my sitting down and my rising up. If I go to Sheol, you're there. If I go up to heaven, you're there. Um, I would say that God's knowledge is, the, the language about God's knowledge is biblically motivated. But I think that in light of the doctrine of divine simplicity, it has to be reinterpreted as referring not so much to an intrinsic state of God, a kind of a passive recept, you know, receptivity to states of affairs that is reflected in, a, in an adequate judgment, I would say that God's knowledge, you know, these, these biblical affirmations about God's knowledge are really affirmations about the way the world is. Uh, you know, there's a psalm, I forget which psalm it is, um, where the psalmist is, you know, decrying the language of some people who say that they will escape God's judgment because, you know, does the, does the Almighty, does the, all, does the Most High really have knowledge? You know, does he see these things? Right. You know, we're going to get away with it. God doesn't know these things are happening. He minds to himself. Uh, and of course, the psalmist rejects this position. I would say that the doctrine of divine simplicity would require interpreting God's knowledge in terms of the way the world that God has created functions. Uh, God knows everything in this sense. Sinners will not get away with it. No matter where you are, you are not, you know, outside of God's attention. You are not, uh, um, you know, in a place where God couldn't possibly produce an effect or, you know, save you, things like that. So God's knowledge is basically a, uh, a way of saying that we cannot escape God. We cannot get away from him. We cannot hide from him. If we sin, we will eventually be punished. If we cry out to him, our prayer will be answered, etc. It's not a, an intrinsic state of God. It's a way that God has created the world in such a way that it, he's created the world in such a way that we cannot escape him. Okay, so I want to just make sure I'm following this. So Classical, the so okay, if I'm committed to my simplicity, I have to say that God's knowledge is not intrinsic to God, um, which means I'm going to have to be rejecting a bunch of classical statements from Augustine and Aquinas and Peter Lombard and Boethius and so on. Um, so I feel like that's a really big cost if I have to reject what the major proponents of classical theism are saying about omniscience. Um, and if then if I have to say also that like God's knowledge is something, is not actually a statement about in anything about God, it's a statement about the way the world is. Um, I've, I've lost my like my grasp on why we should call this knowledge uh, because knowledge seems to be like things that knowers have. It mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be a statement about anything else. So um, I, just, I just feel like, yeah, this, that we've just basically given up the claim that God is omniscient and the claim that God knows anything. Um, yeah, like, yeah, I just feel like I've lost my grasp on what omniscience could possibly be. It seems like we're just rejecting omniscience. Uh, and that seems like a really big cost for any model of God. I think that the tendency is always to use these words, which have a certain meaning in the context of human beings and finite existence, and then to try to attribute them to God, but all the background habits of understanding are still at work. Right? Sure. Obviously, for me, knowledge is something intrinsic to me. It's a property of me as a knower. Um, if God knows things that are contingent, right? if he knows, for example, that I exist, um, and I interpret this knowing in the same way that I know that I exist as a kind of a passive, you know, receptivity to the fact of my existence, then it's obvious that God could not know in that way, given doctrine of divine simplicity. But that's why when we talk about God, these words, knowledge, power, etc., have to be radically reinterpreted. Uh, we have to be aware of the fact that God is utterly unlike us and utterly unlike the, the sorts of things that we normally and by default uh, uh, use these terms to refer to. Uh, 
you know, before we start talking about God's knowledge, we're talking about whether or not you know who this is, do you know who mommy is, do you know who daddy mm -hmm. is, what animal is this, etc. Right. So our our language always starts, you know, by referring to the world. But when we get to the when we accede to the thought of God, we're talking about something that is outside of the world and that doesn't resemble the world in any way. So we have to be aware of the fact that our habits of language have to adjust. We have to make adjustments in our understanding of terms. And that's why I say that when you talk about God's knowledge of external things, you have to basically be talking about the way that God has created the world. How do, you know, why is it that the psalmist can say, yes, God does know, yes, the Almighty does have knowledge, because the way that God creates the world, sinners will not escape forever. They will eventually get their comeuppance. Um, now, notice, I've made a distinction between God's knowledge of something outside of himself and God's knowledge of himself. I don't know what God's knowledge of himself is. I have no idea, right? I just mean to say that God's knowledge of things outside of himself has to be interpreted causally. You know, he causes these mm. things. The world that he has made is of such and such a nature, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so, again, the worry I have is, so, okay, so if I start with, like, my language about other things, you know, and then I say I want to apply them to God, and I've got to make adjustments, like, you know, sure. Um, if I have to say that, like, God's knowledge is not referring to God, it's about, like, extrinsic features of the, uh, like, things extrinsic to God, external to God, then I feel like I, that's not even, like, analogy, like, it's equivocation. Like, I've, com I've completely changed the meaning entirely um, to such an extent that I, I feel like I should just just reject the claim that God has knowledge. Um, if all I need is something like uh, just, ca like, causing the things to be a particular way, I could have a completely, like... Um, I don't know, I guess I could have just about anything that doesn't have, that's not really a God uh, do that. So like, say like a, I've got some sort of karmic system where things are just like, are just causing things to be the way they are. They're non-personal agents. They're completely unconscious. Um, there's basically like these sort of brute laws of nature. I guess I could say that has knowledge in this sort of way, but that seems wrong um, to me. And I, so I'm really struggling to see, I guess the difference now between like some sort of like uh, like impersonal like law of nature, like a karmic law of nature and like a, a simple God because neither of them seem to have knowledge in any sort of meaningful way. Like, I, I, yeah, I, I, do you see, I don't know. Do you see what I'm getting at? I feel like I'm really losing my grasp on, on what's, what's even what we're even talking about now. Yeah, I, I, I understand uh, the point that you're making and I think it has force. Effectively, what we're doing is, um, you know, when we talk about knowledge, we have in mind something like what we mean when we refer to ourselves as knowers or when we refer to other people as knowers. And then we come into contact with this thing that is not like us. And then we think, well, why even bother talking about it as knowing? Um, remember, I did say that the Bible uh, talks about God as having knowledge. You know, does the Almighty have knowledge? Of course he does. And you will not escape him forever. He is just and he will punish you. Um, so I think that the talk... Here I would refer to what Dionysius says, I think in the mystical theology, if not in the divine names, he says that because God, the divine principle, is utterly beyond all our understanding and totally simple, and because we don't have adequate words for it, we mm -hmm. need Holy Scripture to give us a language for talking about it and a way of like understanding it, even if we recognize that the language is not metaphysically adequate in every respect. And we talked a little bit about this um, the last time we, we chatted. That's what I would say, I guess. I would say that the language of Scripture provides a way of speaking and of thinking about God that is helpful, that orients us, that makes us to live our lives in the way that God wants, um, even though it's not metaphysically adequate in every respect, and even though it's, it's um, you know, it, it, uh, it is very difficult to understand what God is really like. Obviously, I'm going to say that what God is in himself, we have no idea, right? right. So if, if knowledge involves reference to this in himself— then I don't know what that in himself is. I sure. only know the outside. And what I know is that sinners don't escape him forever. I know that the world you know, that he's created is intelligible and displays a certain order, that it's headed in a certain direction, uh, and so on. So I can talk about the outside part. I just can't talk about what God is in himself. That's where mm -hmm. I have to say I have no idea. Right. Okay. So I guess the only comment I have at this point is I guess I want to really emphasize like how inadequate Scripture is to describe God. So scripture describes God as having intentions, uh, making choices and decisions, uh, doing certain, th making particular acts. And these are supposed to be things like that are actually true about God. Whereas some of the stuff you've laid out, like God doesn't have any intentions or deliberations or choices. Uh, these acts uh, seem like they're extrinsic to God. Uh, this knowledge, well, that's, that's definitely not an intrinsic feature about God at all. It's, uh, it's something actually about the way the world is. And so that that doesn't, I guess I would, I want to say like scripture then wouldn't even be just like 
inadequate. I think it would just be false. Um, yeah, like I, yeah, I really, I really would think like if this is the model of God that we have, then everything going on in Scripture would just be literally false. Um, yeah, I think that would be my, my, yeah, I think that's where I would stand on this. If I have to, if I have to go to these sort of links to say God's knowledge is is not even like an intrinsic feature of Him, um, yeah, that'd be my big worry here. I think that we can take, for example, the episode with Moses, um, mm-hmm. you know, interceding for the Israelites. They worship the golden calf. Moses goes back up on the mountain. Um, you know, God tells him, uh, see how wicked they are. They've done this. You know, leave me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them. And of you, I will make a great nation. Moses says, no, don't do this. Why should the nation say that you brought us out of Egypt just to destroy us, etc.? You know, for your namesake, whatever. And then scriptures, and then the scripture says that God relents or he changes his mind and he doesn't destroy them. Now, if you're a classical theist, you have to just admit that's not true. It's not that God changed his mind. It's not like he was ready to destroy them and then he needed Moses to calm him down. So you have to admit that on the surface, on the surface, right, the literal reading is simply not true. Um, now, what does it mean that God relents or changes his mind? Uh, that's a very good point. I would simply, you know, perhaps I would say this. Moses recognized that the Israelites were dis- worthy of destruction, but on the basis of his prayers, God does not destroy them. Now, that's not a literal changing of his mind, because, again, changing your mind sounds like a process that takes place in time, and mm-hmm. classical theism can't allow for that sort of thing. Um, but I would say that it's even if it's like metaphysically inadequate, it's not worthless, because we do still learn something. We learn that God has no... You know, from that episode, for example, we learn that God is not really interested in, like, destroying sinners so much as he wants people to intercede and to, to you know, plead his mercy. Um, and this is exactly the point. Well, I guess Jonah. I would say we don't even learn that because God doesn't have intentions. He doesn't respond to anything. Uh, it can't be on the basis of anything that I've done, like a prayer that God does anything. He doesn't even have desires. Um, and he doesn't know uh, because knowledge just means the way that the world is. So I have to get rid of all of the, the, the things you just said uh, about how to interpret the passage. So like, I'm really lost here. Like, I feel like I'm really in the dark now. Like what I should, how I, how I should interpret scripture. Yeah. I mean, again, I would have to do more reinterpretation to prevent the misunderstanding. Um, I don't say that, you know, does God have an intention uh, to, you know, does God hear a prayer and then decide to respond to it? No, that takes place in time. He's not like that. Um, but I would say that God has made the universe in such a way that when people pray for things, uh, subsequent events happen because of those prayers. So God can create things in such a way that there does obtain this because of relation between an event of a prayer and a later event that to which the prayer referred. Um, you know, sometimes that takes place, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes our prayers go unanswered. Uh, but this is just the way that God has created the world. I think this is what Thomas Aquinas says in his discussion of prayer. Why do we intercede for things? Why do we ask God for things if his will is immutable? Well, we ask God for things so as to get those things which he's prepared for us. Um, so I interpret Aquinas as saying that God has made the world in such a way that uh, our receiving of various things can be explained through you know, our praying. Um, and here I would use the following analogy. You can play a piece of music, and in any well-written piece of music, the meaning or the significance of later measures depends on prior measures. Right. When you hear, for example, a cadence, you have tension and you have resolution. The resolution really only has content. It only feels the way it does because of the earlier tension. Um, so, you know, you have this horizontal way of explaining. This is a resolution because of the prior chords that came before it, um, you know, that were tense. And this is a resolution of those tensions. But that's a sort of a horizontal analysis. An actual performance depends on somebody playing the instrument. Right. So. The music itself can be interpreted horizontally, right? The relation between measures or between motives or whatever. But then the music itself only exists because somebody plays it. And -hmm. something similar happens in the world. Some events happen because of our prayers. But the whole thing only happens because God causes it, right? So there's a horizontal Mm -hmm. level explanation. Some events happen because of other things. Uh, For example, I receive a gift because I prayed for it. But the whole thing only takes place because God actualizes the world uh, in that way. Right. So let's, I guess, uh, get really clear on how that happens, though. So it's not that God wanted the world to be this way, because he doesn't have wants or desires or intentions. It's not that God chose the world to be this way, to set the world up this way. So he doesn't have, because he doesn't have choices. He didn't act to make the world this way, because he doesn't have those sorts of actions. Uh, and there's no difference-making principles. So God just, it's just this pure actuality, and a world just 
some particular world kind of happens to come into existence that has these features. Yeah, this uh, is this is yeah. the way the world, you know, this is the way the world is, you know, that God has created. This is how God has created the world. That's yeah. what you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Would you like to move on to the to the last argument? Yeah, do we have time for Sounds it? Sounds like a good time. Yeah, yeah, we've got time. Yeah. Um, okay. we, we, no one's really sent in any questions, so if if we do mm-hmm. start to get questions in, then then we can maybe turn to those at the very end. But I think that we have time. Yeah, and let's get to... Uh, so this one is called Oh, Behave, the Horny God Objection. So we'll turn it over to Stephen to lay this one out. Actually, I would prefer that Ryan formulate the argument. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I, I, I will uh, respond to him. So let him formulate it, and then he can provide a response and then we can we can go into the discussion further yeah okay so this is one of the most uh like entertaining arguments i've ever got to to write on um so it's focused on this particular understanding of passability there's a couple different ways you can understand divine passability um but a lot of people who affirm divine passability they like to play up the fact that god has empathy and and so linda zegzewski has this particular claim that god is omnisubjective which means that God is, uh, fully understands what it is like to, to be you. So he's sort of like Bill Clinton. He can say, I feel your pain in some sort of way. And there's like really deep sort of way. And he can say it for everything. Every sort of conscious state that any creature has, God can say, I feel that. I know what, I understand what that's like. And so this guy named Richard Creel, he just kind of goes, whoa, 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 hang on a second. So God feels literally everything that you feel. And if you're going to affirm omnisubjectivity, be like, yeah, yeah, everything that you feel. And so Creel's gonna be like, oh wait, no. everything? You're late. You mean everything that I, that you feel? And you're like, yeah, yeah. And you're like, okay. Well, does God know what it's like to be horny then? And and you're like, well, like yeah, I guess. So, you know, because if he feels everything that I feel, then he's gonna know what it's like to, to be horny. And and so you, there's a couple of ways you could kind of tease this out. One way is just go like, just to go like, hang on. Like, if I have to say God knows what it's like to 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 feel horny, like something's just gone wrong here. Like I, like that's really creepy. And you don't even have to like really like tease out the objection. You'd be like, that's just is a creepy full stop. And so I can't I can't buy this model of God. Uh, another way to kind of tease it out is um, the way Creel does. He's, he's, he looks at some other cases. So uh, a, a, a sadist is, is one of the examples that he looks at. So a sadist is like someone like they just really love inflicting pain on other people. And um, and so the sadist might be like really happy about like uh, torturing his, his innocent victim. And so Creel's like, so God knows what it's like to take the light in torturing the innocent. Well, that seems like that would conflict with God's perfect goodness. You can't have a good God like know what it's like to, uh, you know, inflict uh, pain uh, on an innocent person and, and just like and, and delight in that sort of stuff. So you could either just go like, horny God, that's creepy, don't want it. Or you could try to tease it out a bit more in this in sort of way and be like, it seems like God's uh, empathizing with some really immoral emotions. And can a perfectly good moral being actually do that? Ooh, I don't know. And so that's the objection. Stephen, was there something you want to add to that? Yeah, I would add an even further point. I would say that like, typically our feelings are responses to environmental stimuli, so to speak. Uh, for example, the feeling of fear uh, is a response to the, the perception of a danger in the environment. Um, and my fear is rational, let's say, to the extent that there is actually a dangerous thing there. Um, and I, I have actually judged things accordingly. Um, does God know what it's like to be fearful? It would seem that, no, he could not possibly know what it's like to be fearful, because fear is a response to a perceived danger, and nothing can harm God. He exists necessarily. Nothing can, you know, kill him. Nothing can put him out of existence. So there's literally nothing for him to be afraid of. Nothing can affect him. Things only exist if he exists to cause them, right? And they only have as they only have as much causal power as he gives them. So he could not possibly feel fear. On the other hand, if he does feel fear, his fear would be an irrational one and not a rational one. So it seems to me that this notion of omnisubjectivity and this this you know connecting of uh, omniscience with uh, knowing what it's like, you know, I think that this is just entirely mistaken. It's it's a, it's a it's a, a hopeless endeavor. Right. Yeah. So let's get a bit more clear on emotions, and then I can get a bit more clear on empathy, and then we can see how like you might respond to this sort of stuff. So, um, so like Stephen pointed out, like emotions are, they figure out like a particular way that they feel and they're about something. So I'll, I'll define an emotion for this talk, I guess, as, um, a, a felt evaluation of a situation because that has a nice ring to it. So you can preach that sort of thing on Sunday morning. So it's, it's a felt evaluation of a situation. And so emotions, they have two things going on with them. They've got, um, like a mental dimension or a cognitive dimension. 
and then they have an affective dimension. So the cognitive dimension is whatever it's about. So like seeing a barking dog, uh, you might see it uh, and, and, and re mentally represent it as being scary. And so you give it a particular value, being scary. The felt value, the felt aspect of it, the affective aspect of it, that is the way it feels to be scared, uh, it, the way it feels to make that sort of evaluation. And so you've got to have these both of these components for an emotion um, to be able to say, like, it's representing the way the world is, and it feels a particular way to make that representation. Now, empathy is going to have sort of a cognitive aspect to it and a affective aspect to it. So when I empathize with, with Stephen, I know that Stephen has a particular emotion, uh, say, like, Stephen's scared of the dog. And and then I also know what it's like to, you know, to, to, to have that sort of, like, fear or that being scared. And then on the basis of something about Stephen, like, I'm able to develop the belief of, like, this is what it's like for Stephen to feel scared by the dog. And so empathy here, the, the, the thing that's really important to know about empathy is that when I come to empathize with someone, when I achieve empathy with someone else, all I'm coming to know is that this is what it's like for them to feel this way. Because I can have my own reaction to the situation. Like, I might um, empathize with Stephen and be like, yes, I can see, you know, this is what it's like for Stephen to be scared of the dog. But, like, that dog's not scary. Come on. Uh, what's, what's wrong with you, man? Um, so I can have my own uh, response to what I gain from my empathetic knowledge. So there's a, so because whenever I'm empathizing with someone, I'm never, like, blurring my judgment on the situation. I'm never bl blurring my evaluation of the situation to be theirs. Because that would be irrational. Um, so when I'm empathizing, I'm like, this is just what it's like for Stephen to feel this way. Uh, Stephen, did you have something? I didn't know if you wanted to weigh in on that. Some... No, no, no. That, no, no. That, that sounds good for now. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so when it comes to empathy, so there's a couple of ways you could try to do this. So I don't particularly buy into omnisubjectivity. I think it's too strong. But I'll just tell you, like, uh, Zegzepsky's response to this sort of, like, horny God objection. So she'll say, so what? Um, God knows what it's like for you to be horny. That doesn't mean God's going to be horny. Um, because again, like when you empathize with someone, you're not necessarily agreeing with their evaluation of the situation. You could interpret things a lot, very differently. You could respond in lots of different ways. So Zegzepsi just kind of goes, meh, who cares? God knows what it's like for you to feel horny. So what? Um, and, and so she'll go even a step further. She'll say, if God doesn't know how to empathize with you, then God cannot be a good moral judge. Because sometimes when I uh, empathize with people, um, I'm able to make better moral judgments on the situation because of that. So she'll give you this example. So she'll say, um, the movie, there will be blood. You're watching the movie. You're empathizing with the, with the, with the bad guy in the movie because that's the way it's kind of written up. Like you're like able to really get inside this guy's shoes and really understand this is what it's like to be him. And she's like, you're able to empathize with him. Does that make you a bad person because you empathize with him? She's like, no, probably like you empathizing with him makes you go, oh, you are a horrible, horrible human being. This is not a good way to look at the world. This is not a good way to behave. And so you, in the very process of being able to empathize with a villain in a, in a movie like that, you're able to see just how villainous they really are, just how bad they are. And she's like, right, a good moral judge is able to really get in someone else's shoes and understand this is really fully what's going on. And, and so when I'm empathizing with someone, that's how I get access to all the moral facts. So if God's not, doesn't have this like maximal empathy, this like, you know, this omnisubjectivity, then she's going to be like, then I don't know how you're going to fill out the claim that God uh, you know, is perfectly good or able to be a good moral judge. So you can whine all you want about God and how weird it feels that God knows what it's like for you to be horny, but she'll just be like, I don't care. Um, this is what you need to really say. God's perfectly good and he's a good moral judge. So I'll pause right there just to see like uh, some of the reactions just to that. You know, I, I find her line of response interesting. I would, uh, my initial uh, worry would be like, okay, well, it would, a good person could not, in principle, empathize with some things. Some things are just so horrible that they remain incomprehensible to anybody who has a moral sense. Um, and it, it may even be a sign of a defective moral sense that you can understand why somebody might want to kidnap a child and, you know, eat its flesh or, you know, whatever. Um, <clears throat> there are some things that are just so perverse and so dark that it's, um, it's uh, you know, the, the better you are as a moral person, the more unintelligible to you and the more um, <clears throat> uh, absurd it becomes to you. 
Um, so I, I, I suppose my initial impression, my initial intuition is that like some things, if you're, if you're good, some things cannot make any sense to you. You cannot relate to them. Um, and the further you get away from evil, the further, the better you are as a person, the further you get away from evil, the less intelligible it is to you. I think mm -hmm. also, for example, of cases like you have in, in Plato's dialogues, you have dialogues between Socrates and the sophists. And they represent basically, you know, polar opposite worldviews to the point that they can't even like talk to each other. Um, you know, you have Gorgias or Callicles, for example, who have this very relativistic sort of Nietzschean will to power kind of thing. And then you have Socrates, who has, you know, his own worldview. And at some point in the discussion, they just simply can't understand each other. One person seems to see so clearly that this is the case. And the other person seems to see so clearly that the opposite is the case. And I've had instances like that with, in discussions with friends of mine. We just become so different and we see things so differently that we can no longer understand each other. We can mm -hmm. no longer uh, attain to an empathetic understanding of one another. Um, and uh, my initial suggestion would be that the relationship between maximal, you know, a, max, a morally perfect being and a wicked person, just like a, a total bastard of a person, could only be that way. It could only be purely unintelligible to a maximally morally perfect person why a wicked bastard would do the things that he does. Right. So, so two thoughts, uh, one in defense of Zygzebski and then one in rejection of Zygzebski's uh, omnisubjectivity. So in, in defense of her, she's going to go, well, look, um, you can't really say God's omniscient if there's more things to know and he doesn't know them. And then Aquinas even says this, too, because Aquinas has got these points where he's like, well, if I know X and God doesn't know X, well, then is God really omniscient? Um, so, so there's a, like a long precedent here of being able to say this sort of thing. So if there are these certain, like, if there are certain like cl things to know about the way the world is, like how like a really horrible human being, what it's like for them to be that way, then Zygzebski's gonna be like, if you want omniscience, God better have that. Um, but so that's in defense of her. Here's what I want to say in, 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 uh, to reject it though. The passibilist tradition before process theism hit the scene and wanted to start saying God feels everything that you feel, but even more so than that. Um, there's people like uh, Francis McConnell, who is from Indiana, and then Bertrand Brasnett, who's from uh, here in Scotland. And these are in the like, early 1900s. They both say, like, there are certain things that God just cannot know. And, and that's partly because he is morally perfect. And so they're willing to just go, do I have to like limit God's knowledge uh, at the cost of like moral perfection? Well, of course, why not? Can God really know fully what it's like to to delight in in like you know hating your enemies? And Brasnett says no. God could have a scientific knowledge of what of like of that you hate your enemies, but God could know what it's like to hate your enemies in terms of like some sort of like you know really embracing that fully. So what uh, what some of these earlier pastoralists are doing is they're going to say God's got a whole range of emotions as he's responding to the world. When it comes to empathy, God's going to have some limits here. Like, he's not going to be able to really empathize with absolutely everything. And they're going to say, yeah, it is a limit to God's knowledge, uh, his, um, his empathic knowledge or his phenomenal knowledge of, like, what it's like. But they're going to say so much the worst because, like, you know, like, otherwise we'd be saying God's not morally perfect. So they're willing to say, like, yeah, that's right. Um, but, you know, God's still going to have a whole range of emotional responses, uh, some of which are going to go, I just can't empathize with you because I think it's so morally disgusting and I'm so revolted by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, I really would say that the problem with these discussions is trying to think of God's knowledge, you know, by analogy to our knowledge. Our knowledge is of various kinds. Uh, there's like affective knowledge, knowledge of what it feels like. There's what you might call propositional knowledge, right? Judgments that we make about state of affairs. Um, there's self-knowledge. There's, you know, the sort of like immediate intuitive awareness that we have of ourself and of our own existence and so on. Um, our knowledge is variegated and it's, it's, um, you know, it's of a certain sort. I think the, these dilemmas arise only because you think that God's knowledge has to be like ours. It seems to me preferable. Just say, no, God's knowledge is nothing like ours. Um, to the extent that we can understand what God's knowledge is, it's a causing. It's, it, God's knowledge is causing things. Um, you know, God's knowledge of outside things, let's say. Um, and to, you know, as for what God's knowledge in himself, God's self-knowledge or whatever, uh, we simply have no idea. We have no access to that sort of thing. Who can know what that is? Uh, all that we can know about God is uh, the effects that he creates and the fact of his creating them and the relations that hold between them. So I would, I would you know, I, I think that this whole discussion can just be avoided by rejecting the analogy of knowledge between us and God. So if we go down that path, I think there's a really serious consequence here. 
we cut ourselves off from the entire classical tradition of thinking about God. So here's what I mean by this. So Augustine starts with what different kinds of knowledge are there? And he's like, well, there's knowledge of like, you know, you see things from the world and you like take it in. Uh, there's knowledge from testimony because, you know, people tell me stuff. I learned some things and there's a self knowledge. And he's like, we all have experiences of what that's like. Um, and he's like, well, God can't have like testimony because who's going to tell an omniscient God? Like what's, what's up? Um, God can't like, his knowledge can't be like based on perception, um, because he's the one who's like causing all these things. So he's like, God's got knowledge that has to be just purely self-knowledge. And then there's lots of elaborations on what that self-knowledge is like of like knowing all the things that he could possibly cause because he's able to reflect on all of his perfections and the ways those things can be imitated. So if I want to say we don't even know what God's self-knowledge is like, then I lose the entire doctrine of divine ideas. So I've lost a big element of the classical uh, understanding of God and how I develop classical theology. If I give up propositional knowledge, then I, again, I lose the entire uh, like account of God's like foreknowledge that the classical tradition has developed. I, I lose the entire ideas of God's counterfactual knowledge uh, based uh, that the classical tradition has developed. And if I give up affective knowledge... Well, then I give up the like the core claim within the doctrine of impassibility, which is that God's self-knowledge entails that there is a phenomena of what it's like, and that's pure, unbridled bliss. So if I give up, um, you know, if I want to say like God's knowledge is nothing like ours, there's no even no analogy whatsoever, then I've lost all these elements of the classical doctrine of God. So it seems like if I do that, then I'm giving up classical theism, at least the Christian version of classical theism. And that seems pretty bad if I'm trying to defend classical theism. Yeah, I don't mean to say that we have to reject every form of knowledge that we have. Um, I, you know, I, I wouldn't deny that God has self-knowledge. I wouldn't deny that he has a kind of a, an immediate uh, awareness of himself. Um, so I, I don't deny that God has an inner life. I just don't know what that inner life is. And I wouldn't deny that there is a relation between God's knowledge of external things and his inner life. Uh, I would just say that God's knowledge of external things is not a passive receiving of them, you know, in the way that our knowledge of external things is. Uh, obviously, God produces his effects in turn, in, you know, in, in virtue of himself. So if his producing his effects is his knowing them, then his knowing things outside of himself is grounded in his being, in himself, which is, you know, identical to his self-knowledge. Um, so there is nevertheless this relation between his knowledge of externals and his knowledge of himself. But I just mean to say that like, we, we have to set aside this idea of knowledge as a passive receptivity. The knowledge of things outside is not passive and receptive. The knowledge of himself in himself, I mean, who knows what that is like. It's probably just sort of like this immediate intuitive awareness of thought that's identi identical to himself. I really don't know what those things mean. Those are mysterious. Uh, so I, I, I don't know that I'm necessarily denying various claims that... Uh, classical theists and the Christian tradition have made. I just mean to um, perhaps try to get across the idea that these formulations are less um, intelligible to us than they might first appear. We're really like grasping. We're really trying hard to understand what is the relationship between those two things. And it just is not obvious to us because we have no analogy in our experience. There's, you know, there's only one God. There's not gods on every corner. Um, so I can't go and consult him. I have no, you know, I don't have the, the requisite experience and familiarity with God. When I'm dealing with God, I'm dealing with something that is so different that it's really hard to come across the right words to talk about it. What do you say that we transition at this point to some Q&A? Okay. Sounds good. Sound good? All right. So yeah. we have one super chat from Eli Whaley. He said, I think it's a he. He says, what rejections of Swinburne's view of God's eternity do you have? Oh, okay. Uh, I guess that would be more directed towards Stephen because uh, a lot of stuff about Swinburne's view I'm quite happy with. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not very familiar with Swinburne, so you can correct me where I'm wrong. It's been oh, okay, a long sure. time since I've read Swinburne, um, but let me see if do I understand or, or do correctly? you want me to say the view first and then and then yeah that might be good would that yeah, be better yeah. yeah okay so Swinburne's view of divine eternity is um that God's temporal so he's going to say uh prior to creating the universe you could either have God existing in some sort of state of affairs where it's just like a single moment or it could be a series of moments um he's agnostic on that issue I think he should say just one single moment but he's going to say God's not undergoing any intrinsic changes uh prior to creation Mm -hmm. And then once God creates a universe, um, then you're going to have uh, a new moment in the life of God. And so for any subsequent act that God does, he's going to have new moments and new moments and new moments and on and on and on. Mm 
And so God's eternity just basically just means existing without beginning, without end. Um, but he does have succession. So that's the kind of the, the view in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the problem here is that Swinburne tends to understand God as a being, which, of course, classical theism denies. Uh, God is not a being. He is pure, undifferentiated actuality. Uh, so that means that he's not in time. He doesn't undergo successive changes. He doesn't uh, go from being one way at some point and being a different way at another point. Uh, he doesn't react to things. He doesn't. He's not affected by anything. He only ever effects, but he's not ever affected by anything. Um, so I would just say that I, I I would have to reject it. I think that the I think that um, Swinburne's conception of God is exactly what. Uh, classical theism denies God is not simply another being among beings. He is on a different plane. He is different. He is uh, unlike beings, and this also includes the fact of his atemporality. Okay, so uh, I, I, there's actually a really intelligent question here from Brando. He says, and I think this is directed at Stephen: If God cannot make free will choices, why would there be a beginning to the universe instead of there just always being a universe? That's, that's a good question. Um, you know, uh, Ryan is the expert on philosophy of time. I am not. Um, so I, I don't pretend to be able to uh, speak very intelligently about this sort of thing. I would simply say this. Um, God causes the universe to exist indeterministically. Um, uh, I think that an eternal universe is a possibility. It could be that way. Uh, but I don't think that an eternal universe is a necessity, and it could just be that God has indeterministically caused a temporal universe. Um, you know, God stands, you know, as a possible cause of any number of universes. Some of them might be eternal, some of them might be temporal and limited in time, at least or having a beginning. Um, so I would just say that God indeterministically causes a temporal universe. Now, how does that work? I really have no idea. Um, because it's hard to it's hard to think about God's relation to time, except by you know putting them both in sort of like the same sphere. I think of God as like down here, and then time is like you know this moving thing that goes above him. Um, uh, it, it's it's really hard for me to think about time. I don't know how to think about time except on by analogy to space. I think of the whole universe as like a a reel of film, right? That has a beginning and an end point, and so it's really just like a long thing. And then I just do a mental modulation, I think, okay, this is not just like the left end of the reel, this is the beginning, uh, and this is not just like the right end of the reel, this is the end. So I tend to, you know, my habit is to think about time in terms of space, but I have to recognize, like, I, I really have no idea how to, if, if that's even adequate. I, I don't think that time is exactly the same thing as space. Um, so I, I tend to think, like, I, these are just mysterious things that are beyond me. I don't know how it is that he created a universe that has a beginning rather than a universe that has always existed. This is just the effect that he has produced. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to, I want to agree. Like you cannot, I don't, I really think you should not say space and time are too terribly analogous because uh, space does not have a direction whereas time does. Uh, I think if you start making space and time too analogous, you've lost any like meaningful concept of time. Uh, but to be fair, hardly anybody will tell you what time is. Like most philosophers of time won't even bother to tell you what time is. And I just find that annoying. So it's like the, the task of my next book is to go like, here's what time is. Um, so I could say <clears throat> something about that. But what I want to say first, though, is I think this is a really serious question, though, that the entire Western tradition has is fought with of like, why should I think the universe has a beginning? Because the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, this claim that you've got God, nothing, and then God with stuff. Like that was really, really implausible for a lot of people outside of Christianity when that hit the scene, because they were just like, well, then God's clearly going to be changing, um, because if you've got God with nothing and then like, and then this universe begins to exist, that's obviously a change. And they're going to be like, well, then you don't have a timeless God. You don't have a mutable God. You don't have a simple God. What's going on here? Uh, and so, and I think that reaction's right, because here's the intuition here. A timeless cause is going to have a timeless effect. Or an eternal cause is going to have an eternal effect. You could say it's sort of, sort of like that. And so if an eternal cause is the ground of the universe, then you would, should expect that the universe itself is going to be eternal too. And that's uh, very deep. It predates Christianity. Uh, 
Uh, you see this a whole lot throughout the entire Western tradition after Christianity eventually develops the doctrine of creation ex nihilo of people constantly going, let's go back to this view because creation ex nihilo does not seem to make sense. And the Christian tradition trying to go like, well, I think we can try to make sense of it. So I think if you're going to try to predict what kind of universe you should expect on classical theism, you should expect an eternal universe. I don't I don't think you should expect a doctrine of creation ex nihilo. I, I think that really does conflict with the classical uh, understanding of God. I would say that an eternal universe is not incompatible with the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, uh, because even if the world has always existed, it's still true that its existence in every moment is dependent upon God, and God, in bringing the universe into existence, does not, you know, act upon some pre-existing material. He simply causes it to exist directly, so it's, it's purely productive. Um, so I, I tend to understand the doctrine of creation ex nihilo not as affirming that the universe has a beginning, prior to which there is nothing. I, I tend to understand creation ex nihilo as meaning that God causes the universe to exist without operating on some pre-existing material. He simply causes it, he produces it in the purest sense. Um, as for the question of the eternity of the universe, I think that this is simply an empirical question you know, I understand from my extremely limited, you know, <laughs> uh, public school science education that the universe had a beginning some 13 or 14 billion years ago at the Big Bang. Uh, and prior to that, there was nothing. Um, so if, if you know, to the extent that this, you know, some very simplistic Big Bang model is true, then the universe had a beginning. It wouldn't follow that, therefore, God is not as classical theism describes him, because, again, the argument for classical theism has to do with the metaphysical conditions of, you know, this suchness, with composite being. And it doesn't matter whether composite being has always been around or whether it has a beginning. As long as there is composite being, there has to be the simple God. So I think that classical theism doesn't entail uh, the, the eternal view of the universe. I think it's compatible with both. And for me, it seems, you know, if Christian theology requires a beginning to the universe, then, as a Christian, I have to affirm it. If science requires a beginning to the universe, then as a scientific person, I affirm it. But I don't think that the doctrine of creation ex nihilo is affected in either case. Even if the universe were eternal, it would still be caused to exist at every moment by God without him acting on a previous, you know, prior, uh, you know, antecedently existent material. So, so let me clarify something here. So when the Christian tradition says um, that the, like, the faith tells us that the universe begins to exist, that is the, that's the affirmation of creation ex nihilo. So like when Aquinas is, for instance, talking about, um, well, I could affirm, uh, like rationally, I could affirm like that the universe has a beginning, or I could affirm that eternity of the universe. He's like, but my faith tells me um, mm -hmm. that it, is, it's, it has a beginning. What he's doing, there's a particular background debate here going on, which is a debate within the Islamic tradition and the Catholic tradition at that moment of, do you believe in eternal creation or do you believe in creation ex nihilo? And if you say it begins, you believe creation ex nihilo. If you say it's eternal, you're denying creation ex nihilo. Uh, and so to kind of tease this out a little bit more, if remember from the last episode when I talked about panentheism, so panentheism says that there's no state of affairs where God exists without the universe, God or, or the created order. So God and created order are have always been. So the universe is in some sense like co-eternal with God. So if you deny creation ex nihilo, you deny this claim that the universe begins to exist and there's a state of affairs where God exists without it, then you're going to be a panentheist. Uh, so these are really sort of the dividing lines here. I suppose I would just say I, I really don't understand the significance of creation ex nihilo in that way. I think mm. that if the universe has a beginning, that brings to light the fact that it does not, you know, it, it, God was not acting on a pre-existing material. He simply brought the whole universe into being, you know, from nothing. So I think that the, the doctrine, uh, the idea that the universe has a beginning brings to light what the doctrine of creation ex nihilo means to affirm. But at the same time, even if the universe is eternal, the, the same affirmation is there. It is still true that at every moment in which the universe exists, God causes it to exist without acting on a pre-existing material. So the, the, the doctrine of creation ex nihilo is still there, even if it is not um, as clear or it doesn't come out as clearly as in the case of a universe with a beginning. I guess, uh, yeah, I guess I'd be, uh, it seems to me then you'd be denying the, the way that's classically formulated. Uh, so like John of Damascus, for instance, talks about there's a, this age before the universe begins, and he says it's a timeless age. Uh, so it's, again, this idea of like there's a state of affairs before. Uh, Boethius makes a similar point. Augusta makes a similar point. Um, 
And then when you look even further back, when the doctrine of creation ex nihilo is being developed, one of the big emphasis is about God, about the universe not being co-eternal with God, is this claim that because God is radically free, he could do this or he could do that. He could create or not create. The whole point was to emphasize his freedom and omnipotence. So if I get rid of all this, so if, so it feels like if I'm getting rid of like this beginning point and the state of affairs where God exists without the universe, I'm really getting rid of a lot of stuff that like the classical Christian tradition developed about based on freedom and omnipotence and so on. So I feel like I'm getting, again, I'm like we're drifting away from what the classical theistic tradition has actually said. I think that that moment is a metaphysical or a logical moment and not a temporal moment. So there cannot be a temporal moment before the beginning of time. I mean, if time has a first moment, then there can't be a moment before it. Uh, yeah. But we can talk about a time before time if we understand that to mean uh, God's existence from eternity, you know, prior, you know, metaphysically or whatever, logically prior to the creation of the world. And there you do have a contingency. There you do have this or that, possibly this, possibly that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so as long as we interpret that moment um, metaphysically or logically, I think there's no problem. But that moment metaphysically or logically understood is there whether the universe has a temporal beginning or if it's always been around. Even if the universe has always been around, it's still true that the universe exists contingently and that God could have caused it or something else or nothing at all. So there is still that moment of freedom, so to speak, uh, even on the, the, the supposition of an eternal universe. It's just a logical moment. It's not a temporal moment. Not as classically understood. So the classical arguments are anything that begins to exist could not be co-eternal with a being that does not begin to exist. And so God's you know, supposed to be eternal and that God does not have a beginning. So this is a very standard argument the patristics on through like the Protestant scholastic reformation. Uh, further, if during that time period, if you're, you're assuming like a, like a more Aristotelian kind of understanding modality, like a lot of them were, if you say the, the universe has always been, like it doesn't begin to exist, you'd be saying the universe is eternal, which you'd also be then saying the universe is necessary. Uh, because they equate eternity and necessity. Um, so it's really, really important that if you're going to go with something like classical theism and the classical understanding of creation ex nihilo, you gotta, you got to build more into the doctrine. It can't just simply be eternity of the past. Do you guys I think mind if we move yeah. on? Yeah, let's do that. Fine. Okay, uh, so I wanted to put up this comment from Jason White. He says, I love the tone of this discussion between Stephen and Ryan, and I think that a lot of people watching, and I mentioned it's at the beginning of the stream, People that watched the previous discussion kind of felt the same way. So, yeah, kudos to you guys for being able to discuss something like this so cordially. It's awesome. Okay, so we have a super chat from, I'm scrolling down to find it. Here it is from Tanner Terry. We put, up on the, put it up on the screen here. Uh, thank you for your super chat, Tanner. He says, Stephen, if there are no real distinctions within God, then the plethora of divine attributes given to God are not distinct within reality. So what can you know of God, and by what means do you know it? I, I can say, for example, what John of Damascus says. Uh, it's clear that God exists, but what he is in nature and essence is totally unknown. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, not because God doesn't exist, but because he is beyond beings, and even beyond being itself. Uh, and therefore, it's better to think about God in abstraction from beings rather than to try to compare him to them or to think about him uh, through the filter of finite beings. So what I mean to say is that what God is in himself, I don't know. Nobody can know. Maybe in the next life we will be given a faculty by which we can un attain to such a vision, uh, but for the moment we don't have it, and I don't know what God is in himself. Um, however, I can know that God exists because the world exists, and the world is of such a nature as to require a cause, and that cause is God. Um, and furthermore, I can know something about God through the things that he's created. For example, I can know that he is not powerless because he produces an effect. I can know that he is not, um, you might, I can know, for example, that nothing like escapes his attention, so to speak, because everywhere there's an effect, there he is also as the cause. Um, I can know, here's a question, can I know that God is good? Um, I would say that philosophically, you know, apart from special revelation, I cannot know that God is good. I have to be an agnostic about whether or not God is good. Uh, in this sense, whether or not the things that God causes are ultimately for my good. That's what I mean by good. Um, God could be good, God could be bad. It could be that, you know, because when we look around at the world, the world is not always favorable to us. Sometimes it's really great, and there are a lot of wonderful things in the world and the wonderful things in our life that we get to enjoy, and they come to us purely as a gift from God, so it's amazing. But there are also a lot of things in the world that are bad. Uh, things that 
you know, destroy our life, things that make our life miserable. And then we ask the question, well, what is God actually? We have all these good things and we have all these bad things. How do we know which is, you know, the, the more basic? How do we know which is the more fundamental of the two? I think that you can only know the answer to this question after the incarnation. When you see the Son of God come and take on human flesh and live among people and preach the forgiveness of sins and die to make atonement for the sins of the whole world and resurrect from the dead and promise eternal life to everybody who believes in him, when you see that happen, then you can know, okay, the end is a good one. Then you can know that God, even though there were signs that he might not be good or that he might not be perfectly good to me, nevertheless, he is committed to me. So there are things that I can know upon special revelation that I can't know philosophically. I think that the problem of evil is resolved theologically through the incarnation, death, resurrection of Christ. Uh, it is not resolvable philosophically. I think philosophically what we can say is that we know that God causes good things, we know that he causes bad things, uh, but which of these things has priority? Is God ultimately good or is he ultimately bad? We cannot know. All right, I think uh, well, let's get to one last question, and this one is for Ryan, and that way we can sort of even it out, and then we'll we'll close this this one out. So from Roger Parada, I don't know if that's the correct way to pronounce that. Sorry, Roger. He says, what does Ryan make of the view that divine unity is based on God having one property from which all other properties follow? Perfection, pure, limitless, intentional power. Oh, sure. There's a bunch of different attempts to try to ground all of the attributes and just say, like, just like you get, you get one, then you get all the others. Mm-hmm. I, I tend to don't buy these. I do think you can make arguments that if you're able to identify one attribute, then you can say they're all mutually entailing. But I don't want to ground it all in just like there's just this one attribute um, that God has and then the others are all like derived from that. Um, so, for instance, if you want to say like, well, God's just perfect. Um, and then like from there, you get all these other attributes. I want to go, no, what it means to be perfect is to have all of the great making attributes um, and to have them to the maximal degree. So I, I guess I would, I'm just interpreting things differently than, than some other attempts um, from people. Yeah, so, so I, I, I find them interesting. And I'm happy to say all the attributes are mutually entailing, but I don't want to go, I derive it all from like one more fundamental attribute. Gotcha. Well, let's let's close it out. So do you have any closing thoughts on the discussion? Actually, a question that I have, Ryan, have you, uh, where is your credence at in modified classical theism? Have you shifted anywhere during the course of this discussion? Oh gosh, I feel like it would go up. Um, so if I have to, if I have to like do a lot of the different moves that Stephen does, that I really, then I feel like I've lost my grasp even what classical theism is. Um, so yeah, I feel like my credence uh, goes up quite a bit more now. Yeah, but Stephen, it it's basically but stayed the same. It's really, yeah. Stephen, what about you? Has your credence gone up or down or stayed the same um, in, in classical the- theism? Yeah, with respect to my opinions, I'm perfectly impassable. I, I, you know, I never change them. They, nothing can affect me. Nothing can change what I think. Uh, I think the same thing. Well, no, I, I'm convinced of classical theism. I think that the argument from this suchness is is irrefutable. Um, I think Ryan, that you know, it's interesting. You were saying like I just don't understand then what God is supposed to be. He's unintelligible. Right. I think then you were starting to understand. Then you like you had a moment where like the the penny dropped and you understood what classical theists are referring to when they talk about the incomprehensibility of God. That yeah. moment of your like, ugh, you know, like what is this? That is exactly the 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 beginnings of the you know the birth of classical theism in your soul. So I think it's a it's a good beginning. I think this I think the development of subsequent years will be will be salutary. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks to, thanks to both of you guys for coming back on. This was a, a great show. It was a great topic. Someone uh, I noticed in the live chat was saying that they're going to have to watch this about three or four times through just to be able to understand uh, parts of it. So yeah, it was, it was a very high level discussion, very cordial, like I mentioned. And yeah, it's just, it, it was really great. So I appreciate you guys coming back on to, to have this. Sure. Thank you for having us. All right, let me talk to the audience as I normally do at this time. So if you are enjoying the discussions that I'm hosting and you would like to support this ministry, the way to do that is patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. You can support this ministry for $5 a month, $10 a month, however much you like to make sure that we continue to do what we're doing, putting out all of these videos. I think at the, the moment we're putting out at least three videos a week. So if you want to continue, if you want to see that continued, uh, and you want to also help support my family and make sure that my two kids are fed, patreon.com slash capturing Christianity is the way to do that. The link is in the description of the video. And uh, last thing I wanted to say is that if you, wherever you fall on the spectrum here, if you're a, a classical theist or if you're a modified classical theist, uh, 
What I want you to do is go into the comments. If you've uh, also, this is, this is important. So only do this if you've watched the entire video. So if you watch the entire debate, do this. But if you're just like watching this at the end, don't do this. So if you watch the whole thing and you, you want to write this comment, then go to the comments and write, by the way, classical theism is true. If that's what you believe, or by the way, modified classical theism or whatever your view is, just list your view in the comments and say, by the way. And, and that'll be cool. All right. Well, I appreciate you guys watching. I, I should have mentioned earlier to uh, to subscribe and stuff, but you already know what to do. If you if you like the, the videos and you like the content, then subscribe to the channel. That's a, it's an easy way to, to help us out. So uh, actually, we just surpassed 40,000 subscribers. So thank you so much for subscribing and watching the content and, uh, and seeing value in this. So I really appreciate it. All right. We'll see you guys later.